Let's see. Yeah, that's good. Cool. Um, let's see. The other thing I wanted to do. My check. <laughs> no. My check one two. My check one two. My check. Okay. Sorry, I need to add my user to a group. That's not gonna work, is it? Because they haven't put the tape in. That's okay. Uh, we're on tape. Linear tape open for Linux geeks. Thank you all for coming today. What do we think of when we think of storage? And if you think of the physical boxes, you're not wrong. Uh, but most of us probably think more in terms of a pile of drives, spinning rust. Uh, maybe SSDs if you're rich uh, or work for a rich company, but um, spinning rust is what you normally think of. Um, or we think of directories and lots of files available to us. This is the OpenBSD re uh, repo for whatever that's worth. Um, but we're going to talk today about data tape. And I don't, and we're specifically going to limit our focus to linear tape open. Uh, this is a collection from the Museum of Obsolete Tape me, uh, Records um, of everything under tape, cartridge-based tape. This is not all the tape. This is just the stuff that comes in a cartridge. Uh, and I guess there are some that don't. But uh, hey, that red one's us. Uh, we're not obsolete, but that red one's us. Um, so. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of options, and yes, you could use them, but most of them have capacities in this realm of kilobytes, megabytes, um, and maybe gigabytes. Uh, we're not talking about those today. We're going to have more fun. Linear Tape Open is a collaboration between three bolded companies, Hewlett Packard, IBM, and Quantum. I hadn't heard of Quantum before either, uh, who got along and said, you know what? Um, Let's have a single thing so we can have a distributed effort. And you might find that uh, distributed effort is taken seriously because uh, neither of those three companies are developing tape anymore. They are making it, they are producing it, but they are not uh, moving the research forward. They are working uh, entirely as the uh, name partners, whatever, but uh, Sony and Fujifilm are the two companies that are actually working on the chemistry of tape and putting more data there. Um, let's talk about the features of an LTO tape, so we're all on the same page here. LTO tapes are about four inches by four inches. That's a tiny picture. It's the best I could do, sorry. Uh, it's about an inch tall. Um, I got one of them popped in red in the tape drive over there. Um, they're pretty small, and 
Uh, let's talk about the inner sides. This red guy is a locking tab. That big spool, that's the tape. It comes out, there's a little pin uh, on the right here, typically. There's a, there's a little pin that uh, is at the lead of the tape, and you just pull it out, and it spools up into the drive, and uh, off you go. Um, this is the insides without it. You may notice there's a little RFID chip in there. Uh, that stores data about the tape, um, how many times it's been inserted. A bunch of stuff that it talks to the drive, it gets rewritten. Um, lots of facts about the tape can be read from RFID. I haven't yet tried with the Flipper Zero, but um, if anybody knows more about open ways of getting that data, it is there. It is part of a tape. Uh, there's also a door to prevent um, unintentional access to the tape. Uh, these are going to skim through. Um, LTO is on the ninth generation right now. This is LTO 1. This is LTO 2. 3, 4, you may notice these are different colors. This is 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. You may notice they're all different colors. Um, that part is not standard. That part is not agreed upon by everybody. Everybody's got their own colors for what they're going to consider a tape. So just because you see a tape of a particular media doesn't mean anything. Um, these things are hard-coded from the factory with, with uh, bands on them because you don't just write from the front to the back of the tape. You write from the front to the back, and then you do it again and again. And again, uh, they've got a number of bands on them, and uh, the important marks about that are uh, the, just that the bands are there, and if you wipe this with a strong magnet, the tape will never be read again. Good luck. Uh, locking tab. This guy is a locking tab. You can move it over. Uh, you may see that on this guy, I did not move the locking tab over. It is in the unlocked position. It's also writing at full speed, by the way, right now. Um, I'm taking a backup of my home directory to this tape uh, right now. Uh, this is unlocked. Locking it moves a piece of plastic over. What does that do? Absolutely nothing. It's up to the tape drive to honor it. The tape drive does, and it will not allow you to write to the tape. Um, these, but it's entirely because uh, uh, it's, a, it's a convention that's agreed upon. It's great. What? Sorry? Absolutely. This type of tape... <coughs> Sorry, folks. This type of tape, um, these are LTO9 from Fujifilm. The one... Yep. These are LTO9. They go for 91 bucks each on, the, on Amazon. Uh, they have... We'll talk about capacity in a moment, but uh, you'll see at the bottom, uh, if you look at the two things, you may notice one of them has a gray bottom and the other one doesn't. That part is standardized. The gray bottom ones are only available from LTO3 onward, and therefore the um, data, com data requirement law um, that you can't delete any data ever. Um, and the... They, they are write once, read many div tapes. The ones at the gray bottom, you can write to them, but you, then you can never erase them. Again, I think that's enforced by contract um, more than anything else, but uh, I haven't had cause to buy one. Um, but if you want to write once and then make sure you don't accidentally write it again, you just move the locking tab. Um, but everybody else, uh, if you need it for... Uh, fed for, for re regulatory reasons or whatever, that you wrote it once and you never write it again. Um, the gray tapes exist. Uh, this is one of those uh, write once, read many's um, from Keeler Packard. And this is the, uh, the worm tapes cost a little bit more than the non-worm tapes, simply because there's no second-hand market. Because uh, once you've written them, good luck. Uh, they are kind of like... Um, Blu-rays that if you write part of the media, you could then write the rest if you've got the right settings. These, by default, you write part of it, and then you can keep writing it another time, and then another time, and then another time. If you, you can just append to it. So if you have, for example, your, um, your incremental backups, and you want to make sure that you've never, uh, that whoever's getting in your system, your tape is live, your tape is in your system, but you need them to not overwrite your previous incremental backups, or hide their handiwork or whatever else, you go ahead, pop in a worm drive, and you write your incremental backups there, and you just keep going. You know for a fact that 
the data on that tape has not been uh, touched. Uh, other features, there's encryption, compression, and partitioning, partitioning LTO4 or 5, LTO5 onward. Encryption and compression are available on drive. Um, I've never used encryption. Um, I do use compression. LTO tapes are advertised with the uh, compressed speed, compressed size. If you're writing highly uh, compressed data already, then you're not going to get the best throughput. But in my practical experience, I found that even data I thought was uncompressible comes out to being written at the compressed capacity to these tapes. The compression is smart, the compression is adaptive, and um, it doesn't, comp doesn't recompress it, it makes it bigger. It's, it's a, the tape drive isn't a dumb, uh, a dumb endpoint. It does a lot of math and work for you. Uh, I've never used encryption, so I can't speak to it, but I know it's there. People talk about it. Yeah. Sorry? LTO4 for encryption? Cool, thank you. LTO4 or more, newer, is required for encryption. Uh, you may see there's a roadmap here talking about capacities. LTO1, 200 gigs. Uh, these are the compressed capacities. So you could see that um, these things go up a bit. Uh, the LTO9 is a little in incorrect, I believe. I think it's 62 terabytes, but I'm, whatever, I'm not sure. We'll talk about that later. Um, it's for 45 terabytes, I think, on LTO9 uh, is what it came out to in the end. But these are p p p different generations, just so you know that they exist. Uh, there's only one spool, as opposed to previous tapes where you had multiple spools, and uh, you, so there were commands to manage that to make sure that the tape itself wasn't too much on one spool or another, whatever. Um, we, we don't do that. We're, it's a single spool. The other spool that the tape gets wound on is inside the drive. Keep your drive clean. Um, massive data. Three terabytes plus, plus, plus. This is uh, um, helpful for data. Um, it's pretty standard. You can find an LTO5 tape. If you have an LTO5 drive and an LTO5 tape, they work together. I haven't found any cases where this is not so, um, even random forums. So um, it looks like it, you don't really care. So long as it meets the standard, you're happy. Um, there are also error checking codes on tape. So uh, the device manufacturer, the tape drive manufacturer, provides binaries that are able to do things like, OK, how accurate is my data? And it will give you a range between fully healthy and you're about to lose all the data on this tape, or some of the data on this tape, and, well, this tape's actually dead because it's actually a range, and it gives you that as a uh, floating point number. Uh, so it checks, and it's able to check the data for you if you need it. Um, diagnostics are available, uh, mostly through the manufacturer again, uh, but uh, how new is my tape drive? How many cycles has it been through? Uh, when did it need a clean? Uh, it, it'll tell you, by the way, there's an orange light on the front that'll light up if you need a clean, um, because you just pop a cleaning tape in and it cleans the mechanism, and then you pop the cleaning tape out. And uh, It's got all sorts of shelf checking and everything else so that it can go, oh yes, this data is right. Uh, when it writes, there's a write head, there's a read head, and then there's a rewrite head so that it can, uh, if, you, if it re writes the data, it doesn't read it back right, it can write it again and make sure that before you end up uh, losing any data so that you don't have any operator intervention or even computer intervention necessary uh, in case a write has gone bad. You can use it like a classic tape, uh, which is how I mostly use them, or there's LTFS. LTFS is Linear Tape File System, uh, and that works by partitioning the tape, that partitioning feature we talked about uh, here. Is, was introduced to introduce LTFS, where there's a partition which is treated as two separate tapes, um, one of which gets the index of all the files, and the other of which gets the um, actual, um, and the other of which gets the actual data that goes uh, there. So you can treat it like there. Uh, a bunch of uh, systems use this to help you manage your files if you're backing up the tape using a standard. Um, 
open source back tape backup salt solution, you're probably going to hear uh, you're probably going to need LTFS available. That's it. LTO five on is where that's available, um, and it's just you can treat it like a file system. Okay, thank you for listening for 15 minutes. Well, why do you care? One of which, one suggestion I made offers a three to one backup strategy. You want three copies of your data, two types of media, one of which is off site. 321 gets repurposed all over the place. Uh, some people now say uh, three copies of your data, two locations, one offline. Uh, you know, you, you, the 321 is a malleable, malleable thing, but that's what, that's what we have. We've got a 321 backup strategy. If you want a severed media, then tape is a good option. Why might you want severed media? Well, tape is susceptible to different things and hard drives. You got your data on hard drive, you got your data on SSD. Uh, these are susceptible to different types of problems than um, tape. Tape is inert. Tape sits there. So long as you are within the requirements for tape, which is humidity and temperature, uh, and no strong magnetic fields, please, because you could wipe it, uh, then you're going to be fine. Hard drives, I've never turned on a hard drive after a year and had it go click. Uh, these mecha mechanical devices are differently susceptible. Uh, optical disc, susceptible to scratching. You know, uh, optical disc, the top layer, uh, don't put anything adhesive on there because that's the layer the data actually got written to. The bottom shiny part is just uh, protection for that layer. So uh, it's easy to accidentally, uh, yeah, yeah. I put all my labels on the paper cases for optical discs now. I don't put any labels on the disc itself, uh, simply because that, <laughs> sorry? No, so uh, just because that is susceptible and data that's susceptible to different things will work differently in the event of um, flooding, catastrophic failure. Tape can handle high humidity for a short time or high temperature for a short time. You can't put it in an oven, but you know, if you have to, you can um, expose the tape to different things, and for a short period of time, it'll survive. Hard drives might react differently. Uh, this is one reason that you might consider. Also, you end up with offline. The other big point where you might care is price per gigabyte. Amazon S3 Glacier. Uh, let's assume for a moment that Amazon S3 Glacier doesn't charge egress or ingress. Let's just assume that. The cost of storing the data is about uh, 2.2 cents per gigabyte. If you look at an LTO 9 tape at maximum compression for the price I found it on Amazon, which is, shall we say, not the preferred way of buying tape if you have a better, cheaper option, but will give you a price, uh, you can get 0.19 cents per gigabyte as well, which basically means um, you're looking at the same cost there uh, per, per gigabyte, and you don't have to pay egress charges. One second. So LTO 8, uh, LTO 5, uh, I priced this out early, um, years ago when I started playing with tape. Um, Glacier was right about, it was two, four cents, 0.4 cents in 2016, and um, LTO5 is pretty competitive with that. Yep. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Um, So you're, so you're saying if you buy an enterprise tape library, you'll buy more for the drive? Yeah, the list was like $25,000. $25,000 for a library with drive? Per drive. Per drive. Per drive, you can buy a license. Okay, so if you buy a library, uh, you're paying... 
the drive costs on top of the library costs. Pretty magically, in fact. In speaking of Glacier, I just wanted to you have to mention that they offer a tape gateway service. Let's say you're an enterprise trying to get off of your tape. Um, Amazon will do your tape for you. They will give you a local tape gateway that exposes SCSI to your computers so that you can then write tape as you always do. And it goes to Amazon, and they write it the tape for you. In their tape libraries that are hopefully kept at right, right conditions, blah, blah, blah. Um, doors knock. So, why doesn't everybody just go out and have a tape for archival storage? Uh, one answer is the linear part of linear tape open. You are going to write and read from the beginning. You can skip files. Can, can you get this mic, man a mic so that the recording gets this? Everything that's written on the tape in a block, and everything's a series of blocks, and you can have, like if you're using backup software, it's gonna write label blocks out there. Everything in a tape mark, if you go back to the old 3420s, you had tape marks, and you can have them here too. Every block of information that's written to the tape drive gets a unique ID sequential ID. When the software is reading the tape, it can say, I want you to position yourself to block 25. And it will do that. And it doesn't start from the front. It knows on that chip is the directory of what's on every single track set. Because you have hundreds of tracks on this tape. And it'll know that you, it moves it over to the track and then starts reading. And it knows it can read backwards. Cool. So yeah, well. you can come from either side. And, and so it positions itself to the object you want to read. In which case, it's only the way I use tapes that um, yeah. enforces the linear aspect. If you write a tarball to a tape, uh, you have to still have to read the tarball. You have to use the tapes blocks. Not, not if, well, what happens is your software, if it knew, could get reported all those um, block IDs, and your software could store those block IDs. No, this block ID, you know, this data is stored in this block ID. Very interesting, thank you. So ignoring that, <laughs> the setup price. We talked, we saw, we saw what it costs to, on Amazon to get an LTO 9 tape uh, drive, and yeah, setup price is real. The tapes have to be kept in a relatively narrow band of temperature and humidity. You can do this, but most climate storage places will give you one or the other. They'll give you humidity, but not temperature. They give you temperature, but not humidity. Uh, so you may find it difficult to find a climate storage unit that just um, does this. So for six months or so, you probably don't really care room temperature and everything is fine and for shipping reasons there are a lot wider bands but for long-term storage to keep the medium itself because this this is deep chemistry stuff uh to keep the medium itself happy you really want to uh stay within that narrow band so talking about the stuff um i work with this manually uh let, let me just do one quick thing That's me. I can't read that. So we're doing, uh, we've written 87 gigabytes since the start of this talk to the tape. Um, 
I work with Hispaniola. I use um, tar, and uh, I, if I need a new tape, I pick up the tape and I put it in. If I need a tape out, I take it out and I put it somewhere else. Um, I have a very manual approach to this, um, simply because um, libraries exist. Do you have a lot of money? Uh, here's a cheap one. It doesn't have any tape drives. Uh, it's 13 frames in Bloomington, Indiana for 500 bucks on GovDeals. Uh, I, it's, up, it's up now if you want it, but um, I don't know what that part is. Could you tell me? Not, not, I don't recognize that part either. Uh, it's either like the arms, but this is the kind of uh, storage you might find in a, da in a frame of a library. And the idea behind frame-based library systems is you add more frames, probably up to a point, probably per library, um, and you get more tapes. And if you have 300 tapes, and each tape storing uh, 45 terabytes uncompressed, uh, you're talking a significant amount of data available uh, for a robot to get and shove in your tape drive and keep you keep keep your data available for you. The thirty five hundred is actually obsolete now. It's the forty five hundred. It's the same, similar, but they made the frames taller, and you can add more tapes. The thirty five hundred, you could put twelve tape drives in a frame. And then the rest of the frame could be used for storage of cartridges. And then they started doing things like, instead of having just an array of slots, the slot would be, say, the depth of the frame. So you, you, they'd be spring-loaded. You could load four in there. They literally, the tape robot would pull them out, stick them someplace, and then pull the one it wanted. Powers of Hanoi, huh? Yeah, yeah, basically. But it's, that's partly why they're so expensive, because this thing is... Well, anything enterprise, the vendors charge more. It's essentially 300 tape magazines in a frame now, is what you're saying. No, there's more than that. Um, if you, have, yeah. <laughs> Anywhere, yeah. I'm pretty sure your last library was a storage tech where the robot is actually it's cylindrical, so it spins around and grabs robots or grabs tape. So you think that's the tape? That's the robot grabber. I think that's a picker. Having never worked with libraries myself, um, I'm going off the expertise of the audience here, uh, but these are all pulled from that same GovDeal listing, uh, for whatever that's worth. If you have buy a library, you're going to spend more. If you're going to spend more, you make it harder to replace. Uh, if you have this kind of libraries that are more than one U, uh, I think they're not called one. They're not called libraries if they're one U. They're auto loaders. Uh, they've got like six tapes or dang tapes or whatever in a one U space, and then they auto load them. It's a library, but it's small. Uh, the power. If you've got more than a one U unit, uh, you've got to figure out the power for this. And I haven't found many uh, open tools for working with libraries, and I think they're mostly dependent on the manufacturer themselves. Uh, giving you the option. I'm getting a shaking head. Most of, the, most of the software enterprise vendors, most of the enterprise software vendors will do all that for you. So if you ever use like net backup, you have like a Rob test, you can actually control the library right from their tools, right from their CLI tools. Which gives us the open aspect of many people can have it, but not the open source aspect of Linux geeks enjoy it. So, and they may be compatible, but it's not the kind of open that um, I like, which is I can run it on my laptop without problems. So if you want to get started, uh, oh, and I've seen people on blog about, oh yes, I have my backup system using tape, and when the library dies, I'm going to have to stop using tape. Okay, you don't need to do a library. You could do a raw tape drive, which is much cheaper. We'll get to how to do that cheaper in a bit. Um, but you end up with, uh, if the library becomes a sticking point, then you're not necessarily going to be able to use your backups long term, which is not the point of backups. So if you're getting started, uh, computer, yeah, uh, computer conference, I think we can manage this. It's software, the Linux kernel has you handled without any modifications up to 32 drives plugged into the single system. Um, 
they, it's modifiable with, I think, one little change to a driver or an IOCTL. I'm not sure what to you tell the kernel, but you can get up to 64 drives in a single system. Uh, if you have that many lanes to talk to your system, I'm impressed. Um, but if you're running just one tape drive, uh, you can just put it off your laptop. That works. Um, Linux kernel gives you a couple devices, and ST0, ST0, and then the same ones with the letters L, M, and A after them. These are the block devices available. NST0 is a non-rewinding device so that it doesn't reset the tape to the beginning at the, at the end of your write. ST0 rewinds back to the beginning. Uh, this it give this may mostly matters for uh, the following seeks or checks or end of file you're running on the tape drive after that. Um, L, M, and A are different block sizes. Uh, I've never used them. I understand that if you do, then you need to make sure you agree with the block size of the people receiving your tapes. And just straight up ST0 and NST0 have worked for me. And if you have more than one, NST1, NST2, blah, blah, blah. Um, the third thing is, if you're trying to get this stuff, I recommend eBay. Uh, we'll, do, we'll put some eBay on screen in a bit. And when you're shopping for a drive, the things that matter are the LTO level, what kind of LTO you do. Let's talk about uh, LTO level for a moment more. Um, LTO1 was capable of reading and writing LTO1 tapes and a previous format I don't recall off the top of my head. Shaking head. I was going to say the original, the, the original contract for LTO was that you could um, read, write one back. You could read two back. Yes. Okay. I believe they've broken that standard now. They have. LTO 8 is no longer able to read LTO 6. They changed the tape chemistry in L in to enable higher, higher things and higher densities, and in LTO 6, tapes were available in both tape chemistries, and trying to keep that compatibility with the newer tape chemistry um, LTO 8 drives, uh, they couldn't get, they, they, they had compatibility problems, so they broke that uh, otherwise promise. But they made up for it by having the LTO 7M type, where you can take an LTO 7 tape and upgrade it to an LTO 8 capacity. Which, but you can't use it in an LTO 7 drive after that, but you could, uh, so that way you could uh, do a one time upgrade. Yeah. Jeff's asking how. It's in, the, it's in the tape drive firmware, it just allows you. Um, but I think LTO 1 was able to read a previous format as well. There was no previous format. Another format by IBM, I thought, but. They, the IBM, as far as I know, this is the first cartridge tape that IBM made. Because before that, they had the 3420 tape reels. Oh, okay. wait, you mean the 3480. There were 3480 tapes, but they were a physical different size. Okay, so it's not those. Um, oh, that's another thing to say. Originally, they were going to do, every two years, they were going to do a new tape LTOs. They've also broken that contract. Yep. And part of it was with IBM, which is different than the others, there was a 3492 drive. The original IBM was 3480s, which did like 50 gig. It only did as much as one of those round tapes. The 3592 was similar in technology to LTO, and what they did was they would come out with new technology every year in either the 3592 or the LTOs, and they would keep alternating back and forth. The 3592 did more a better method of start stopping than the LTO, and they also had a display on the front. I don't if you had it in a tape library, you couldn't see it, but they had uh, an LED kind of display. Um, I know that there's a uh, plenty of information available for if you have your tape library that has both 3592 and LTO tapes. This is how you know they're where they're compatible and where they're not because they're not compatible. But this is how you. Well, they were compatible at one at the. 3592 could be used on the mainframe. The LTO could not. And it turns out the tape library and the tape drives are all SCSI. 
And for the mainframe, they used, you bought a separate box, which had an AIX box in it, and a bunch of channel cards, and a bunch of fiber cards that went over to the tape drives. And you paid a lot of money for that, and it would translate the IBM I.O. orders into the SCSI tape drive orders. In the tape library, a frame could either be 3592 or LTOs, and the hand had to be changed, the picker had to be changed to handle both tape cartridges if you wanted both. Okay. Cool. You also need to know your target cost if you're doing, if you're, when you're shopping for a drive, and you need to know how you're connecting. You can connect over SAS or fiber channel in most tapes, the tape drives that I've seen. They're either fiber channel, like this one over here, um, or they are SAS. Um, both of them are annoying to use from a laptop, but you can do it. Um, both of them have HPAs available from a desktop, pretty just fine, pop in a PCIe card, congratulations, you've been upgraded. Um, this is a tape inside of a tape library that I thought was fun. Um, you see those big bays? Uh, there are four empty bays and two bays below there. Um, those bays, these are not standard either. This is from a quantum tape drive, but these bays take in these cartridges and there's a tape drive that fits in. Tape drive is over there. Um, Ethernet port on the back, there's an Ethernet port passed in directly to that tape drive. I'm not sure what it does. I know that people can use it to set library mode versus independent mode and a uh, bunch of firmware specific stuff. Um, and fiber channel pass through here. There's also a really fun connector here that I've never seen before, but basically is being used for power. If anybody wants to handle this, please feel free. Um, it's a box, it's stuff. <laughs> and the, the tape drive inside it is much more um, uh, important. And then you've got the tapes on the side right there, it's a little you know, library. Let's go ahead and look at some eBay listings for a moment. The Ethernet port that's on the back, can they do iSCSI? I don't know. Please. So, back in the old days when we're still on SCSI, we used to have these things called uh, fi basically fiber channel to uh, SCSI converters. And so what the Ethernet board does, it replaces an old thing called like a, a tape library controller, which basically tells the tape library how to talk to fiber channel if you're in a shared SAN environment. Otherwise, like right now, it's just running like arbitrated loop mode. So it's just kind of like a direct connect. So all of that logic used to be like a separate card you'd put in a library and then connect to all the tape libraries. And it would be a fiber channel to SCSI converter. When they went to fiber channel on those, that all went away, but they still have some way to kind of control the intelligence in the internal fiber channel to SCSI converter to do all that. So in the big libraries, that's all handled by the big robotic center master control part. Cool, thank you. That's helpful, because I didn't have any clue about any of that, because again, I don't work with libraries. So this guy is an LTO3 internal drive. Um, if you look at the back, uh, that looks, I, I'm in a bad angle. That, I'm not sure what kind of plug that is. Is that? That's scuzzy. That's discrete scuzzy, cool. And that's power. Um, if you can't power it, or drive, connect to it, then you probably don't care. Uh, the internal drives tend to be half height, and these are full height. Uh, these are the size of two, five and, uh, what is it, five, five and a half, five and two, five and a quarter, five and a quarter inch bays, but they're not the si they're not two five and a quarter inch bays. They're the size of two five and a quarter inch bays, which means if you have a little piece of metal that separates your five and a quarter inch bays, and you try to fit one of these in, you're just gonna have to bend that metal, uh, because you're not gonna be able to fit it in otherwise. Um, I'm not saying I recommend it, but I have done it. Uh, and this is relatively cheap if you want to just do something like that. Um, let's see, this guy, LTO6, um, 70 bucks for um, an LTO6 drive that says fiber, but um, that, um, oh, 700, okay. Well, that, that's not a fiber connection either. Um, so either the seller's listing is wrong, but um, just be aware that there are ways of powering these things. You can also get these in desktop form factors. Um, probably SAS. Yeah, that's a good call. Thank you. Um, 
the um, desktop form factor, you plug it into a wall, and then you just uh, use it. It's fine. Um, and you can even rent drives if you have to. Uh, you can, uh, I saw someone renting an LTO 9 drive for $145 a day um, that connects to Thunderbolt. To just a, some Thunderbolt 3 connection to your computer so that if you really needed to get drives off, it's harder to rent the older ones, which is why the compatibility forward for the two generations, as mentioned, uh, is helpful. And then this guy um, came out of a tape library, um, and it looks like it's got the full um, chassis uh, here, and uh, it's just fiber channel and LTO, what is it? LTO 5 for 50 bucks? Yep. It, you, you, you can shuck these for, with, with uh, six screws. Uh, eight screws, and yeah, this is very familiar, right? Which is, oh yeah, that's Garland, yeah. Yeah, so um, when you're shopping for, shopping for these sorts of things, um, just the connection mechanism is different. The power might depend, and just be aware that the size of those things, and if you see one of those scary cases, I decided, you know, it's 60 bucks, let's find out. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just drive inside, it's fine. Um, when you're shopping for tape, consider old or new. If you want the jewel cases, they come in nice little jewel cases uh, that you can um, store each one independently and have them separately handled. Uh, the biggest thing that causes a tape failure, according to IBM's website, is uh, you drop the cartridge and you bend the pin or the leader pin or otherwise make the tape inaccessible. Uh, so the jewel case is probably guard a little bit against that. And which company you want, uh, they rate their tapes differently. Um, so some of them have wider uh, tolerances than others. Uh, if you want to carry tapes, Amazon does sell these. Um, kind of cool. Uh, just put a bunch of tapes there, it's great. Um, so for me, I run, for Linux, you can run MT and TAR and get a lot of utility out of these tapes. MT does tape status stuff. Let's find out if MT is available. Sometimes if the drive is doing two things, yeah, I'm getting resource busy. Uh, so I'm writing to the drive so I can't also get information from the drive. Um, but uh, the drive binaries available for your tape drive are generally full, freely available from the manufacturer's website. You want to do powerful things with your drive, I recommend getting them. Uh, this laptop is running Muscle C, not glibc, so I couldn't demonstrate anything there. And these are three open source backup solutions that I'm aware of that are tape drive and library aware. Um, Yadam will do, uh, LT requires LTFS. Uh, I believe, uh, I'm not sure about Amanda or Bacula. Yadam is one of the new ones that if I was starting the adventure eight months ago instead of years ago, I would have uh, started there. Uh, so I'll share a link to that later. Do I have a working thing? Help I had, there we go. Uh, if you have a pile of drives, knowing where your data is important, there's software that'll do this for you. Or you can do it yourself. But there's software that will do this for you. I recommend considering it. Um, and the future of this media, there's a contract that will go for big numbers. Fujifilm says they're going for 400 terabytes per tape. That's cool. Um, it's better than 45 terabytes there is now, but you know. Uh, and the surplus hardware is going gonna, is gonna to get cheaper, um, especially as this continues. Now, well, there are some honorable mentions for the data backup storage world. Um, IBM 3592, uh, where they take, they allow you to take the same cartridge and upgrade to a point, depending on the chemistry. Yep. For 3592, you have to get a new cartridge for each new, new one you get? Okay. And they're alternating generation. And, but it's a different cartridge than the LTO cartridge. And they cost more. The they cost more. The IBM monoculture um, and uh, 50 terabytes of tape is the latest. So that's pretty cool. Uh, discs. 
you can get Blu-rays up to 100 gigs each. If you want them M-Disc uh, M -disc quality guarantees, which uh, give you up to 100 years of data, um, I, they haven't tested that uh, practically, but I think they've tested it otherwise. Um, you can get them up to 25 gigs. Um, that's a reasonable thing. Obviously, it's got the problems of being disk. There's some paper that wrote about 200 terabyte optical disks coming, coming along. When those are available and cheap, I'll get one. Microsoft, Microsoft showed on not this year, but last year's conference for them. And I don't think they're the only one working on it. I think Fujifilm's working on it too. But they had a glass rectangle and they're writing with lasers and they write at multiple levels. And I think it's, it's some horrendous amount of data on there, but it's like a worm. You can only write once, but they think it'll last forever because it's glass. Cool. Uh, when, when those are available and cheap, I'll get those too. Um, so the only, the, if, if the only problem with disk is that if you have strong opinions on disk C versus disk K, and you enforce this, uh, people get mad at you. Um, the, I, I have strong opinions, let's not talk. Um, <laughs> remember a bit about Amazon Glacier. Uh, you could put your, ca put your data in Glacier. It's a little less hassle than doing this, your egress costs will reflect that. Um, it's available, it's possible. Um, and LTO is an open standard, but it's driven by some pretty massive companies who, you know, underlying chemistry and the only IBM is improving drive mechanisms right now. Uh, so it's relatively um, tight knit for an open standard. Um, and if they chose to, they could cut their investment tomorrow and anybody who's invested in LTO would be SOL, but I don't think they would because um, uh, large companies um, with more clout than them have uh, uh, requests for data. Yep. Drives are compatible. Sorry, say that again? The other two vendors are compatible. I mean, that's part of the standard. Yeah, the vendors are reason. compatible across, and Fujifilm and Sony are developing media, but I believe all of them are still manufacturing media. Uh, so that if, if you wanted to get an IBM or a Quantum or an HPE LTO 9 tape, you can. Um, and I suspect when the LTO 10 comes out, there will be multiple vendors for the drives and the, date and, and the, and the cartridges. Um, and this is their proposed roadmap. Uh, if the roadmap continues, which it won't because they've already cut the promises from Gen 10 from uh, more than that to less than that, um, <laughs> you, you're, we're going to see um, at least more data per unit, and that means that uh, this other stuff is going to get cheaper with time. Um, I know that Fujifilm, I think, is still making LTO 5 onward. Uh, I think they're still actively producing that today. Um, they, they, they raised the costs by 5% last year, uh, supply chain, so that uh, I think they're still making it. But they've, if the roadmap continues, um, or continues at all in any semblance, uh, we're going to be able to get very high, and high uh, storage for relatively low volume and relatively low cost. Um, these are some links, uh, if you want to come up later, I'll that you do this, this is just some blog posts and uh, GATAM that I uh, might think you might want to read. Um, and to summarize, data tape is still relevant. I think, I, I, I think I've already made the case that it's, no, it's not an obsolete thing, it is a thing that uh, you should still consider and uh, at least be aware of. Just consider the engineering trade-offs, yeah. Once you're in it, it's cheap to stay in it. Uh, Writing to and from tape, you do it with TAR. TAR is Tape Archiver. Uh, I'm writing to tape right now with TAR. Um, and uh, I can't read any of that because it's the protector's whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, right now we're writing at 73 megabits per second. We've got uh, 199 gigabytes so far through, um, which is not bad for a piece of plastic uh, spinning around. Um, 
LTO gives it more of a monoculture, more than a monoculture, so you're not uh, going to be exclusively tied to certain companies. If you are getting somebody onto it, you're not going to be totally SOL if one company goes bust or something else happens. And surplus hide hardware is a great gateway drug. Uh, if you're interested in uh, um, getting into this for relatively cheap, you can. Uh, and I recommend, if you want to, you should. If you want to play with Bacula, it'll actually write to virtual tapes, which are just files, t tape images. Uh, so you can even play without having the hardware, figure out if you like it, and then go buy a, a tape drive. Good idea. Thank you. Any? Thank you, sir. A couple of quick questions. So we, we touched on LTFS. Is, is LTFS natively supported in Linux, and is there a way to use it with just free software? The tape, open tape managers I mentioned use LTFS straight, mm -hmm. and they are free software. Um, I haven't tried mounting it as a drive. Um, I'm not sure I could, but the 